So on the left there, this is me, when I was, I think everyone was six years old here when they sent the picture. Um, I had a clear idea of what I wanted to be. I think you can see that. Not every day in my life worked out that way, and the costume is too small. But um, I think I, I still adhere to that dream, and every morning I try to fly. <laughs> yeah, and on the other side, it's me. And I don't know my age, but I think I'm around six years old, um, as you also, Sasha. And uh, w when I grew up, I wanted to run my own center with 100 white horses. That was my big dream. But my biggest problem at that picture was how to convince my mom and my dad that I deserve one horse. Uh, I didn't succeed, but uh, today, many years later, I s still have big challenges and things I want to achieve. We have heard here today that uh, we are facing complex, interconnected, social, economic, and uh, uh, environmental challenges. And uh, I really believe that we have to think in new uh, patterns, as so many have said here today. The life mission of a social entrepreneur is to change the world within a specific area. And he or she measure their success according to how much they change the area that they're active within, rather than their individual success. Uh, many social entrepreneurs that we support within Ashoka, they are really creating tipping points, the words we, word we he heard so many times today. They are making us understand the world a bit differently within their area and they are creating new policies, new way of thinking within their area of work. So, what's the most pressing challenges for Sweden or for Scandinavia? What do you think of? What are you re really worried about? What is occupying your mind? I guess we have heard a lot of the challenges expressed here today. And since we launched Ashoka here in Scandinavia, we have been trying to understand more what's the trends in society where we have to look extra carefully for social innovation, for social entrepreneurs. Some of the trends, of course, we see is uh, how can we create an uh, education system that, that give young people the skills that they need for how the world looks today. Segregation, and a lot of other areas and trends that we need to look extra carefully for social innovation. But what if? A great solution for how we can make empathy as important as math in the education system already exists somewhere in the world and that we just have to find a much better infrastructure of how we import social innovation to where the, the, the problems are. So, within Ashoka, we wanted to test this theory, and we did. We created an initiative called the Change Nation on Ireland. We decided to try to understand the 50 most, uh, or biggest challenges on Ireland. And then we mapped out social innovations, system changing solutions around the world that already had a great solution to that challenge. So two years ago, we imported uh, 50 solutions to the 50 most important challenge in Ireland. <laughs> so many social entrepreneurs have a, uh, a challenge with scaling their ideas. It's because they need to find the right seed capital, they need to find the right local entrepreneurs running the, their organizations, they need to find uh, the right partners, and they need to, to find the right um, um, organization around them. So with Change Nation, we could prove that we can lower the barriers for scaling so social innovation by building the infrastructure so the market is ready when the social innovation scale into that country or that context. And today, Change Nation in Ireland 
grow to much more than a process how we can import social innovation. Uh, it's been inspiring in gathering hundreds of business leaders, journalists, political leaders to uh, talk about value in a new way and how to think and act as a change maker within your area of work. So we imported 50 solutions into Ireland and 27 of them are now up running and the rest are still piloting. And uh, Sasha, you are one of the 3,000 leading social entrepreneurs that Ashoka support, and you were also one of the 50 solutions we imported to Ireland. So uh, I am curious if you think, or if you believe, that we could uh, do something similar here in Scandinavia, if we could map out the most pressing challenges and try to find the solutions no matter where they are, uh, were created. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. Of course, here we're in the, the cradle of um, social innovation. Um, in, in Scandinavia, we have the home of the welfare state uh, like it doesn't exist elsewhere. But of course, when you're leading the pack, uh, you can easily also think that you've got it all figured out. You've got big government here, you've got government playing a lot of roles. And uh, what we saw in Ireland was really that um, different stakeholders in society came together to really ask some of the very, very hard questions. The hard questions about many of the themes we heard today about our values, about why our children do what they do or don't do what they don't do, about uh, where are we going next, about challenging questions about the way we do things and about the fundamental model. They did it out of a position of crisis, financial crisis, uh, the ethical and moral institutions of the country were on the floor and people were almost embarrassed about what had happened in the, the tiger years. But I think here we, we, we should consider this as an opportunity if we could come together. And this is really uh, the unique thing in Ireland, I think, was that it brought together people from all parts of society to debate the challenging questions and then to be very, very open-minded about getting inspired and inspiration from elsewhere about what solution could help. You know, and, and, and then it becomes a pact, because we came to a place that had an awareness of challenges, an awareness of needs, a commitment to act if something was found, and we brought another commitment to it. Two years after Change Nation, we are still investing in Ireland, because we were seduced by that society saying, we want to do things differently. And I think that's the strongest possible interaction we can create here. And uh, many social entrepreneurs have a life cycle where the first cycle is that everyone tell you that this is impossible, this is never going to work, and just stop with it. Maybe you can tell us a few minutes about how was your life cycle and what is your idea about? Yes, yeah, so we, we had, uh, when, you, when Apple launches an iPad, immediately almost every citizen on the world that has access to information has access to the knowledge about it, and anyone who can afford it can have it in, in a very, very short time. Now, uh, we work with cities. 50% uh, of the world's population live in cities. And most of the services that people receive that really shape their quality of life, especially if you're vulnerable, are not delivered by national governments, but by cities. So for an innovation like the I iPad uh, to travel from one city to others, um, to reach the most successful innovations have, in 20 years, reached 1% of cities in the world. It's not even snail pace. It's something we can't even imagine. So we asked the question, what if? What if this could almost happen instantaneously? What if we could actually find solutions to problems in one city and immediately make those available to others? So when we put forward this idea to our advisors and we were saying, look, we're going to go for this, we're going to change the world of local government procurement of all things, all our advisors, very smart, enlightened people said, don't. Don't waste your talent, don't waste your energy, you know, this is crazy. No one in the world wants to talk about local government decision-making procurement. It's corrupt, it's intransparent, it's protectionist, it's the worst there is. So, uh, naive as we were, we said, okay, that sounds just like our challenge. And, um, and it's important, because we, we, we looked at Boris, a blind citizen in Stockholm, uses a small technology device called eAdept, and he says he feels 90% less disabled, and he saves the city a lot of money every year. 
Now that solution has been around for three years, so why don't the other 80 million blind people like him in other cities in the world have any of that technology, any of those solutions that could save money for the governments and make them free and enabled? So after a lot of struggling and experimentation, uh, we, we today, uh, after three years, we can say we've made some progress. 82 global cities are changing the way they're procuring, they're changing the way they interact with the business community, they publish their problems, Cities as unlikely as Lagos or Moscow are making the biggest commitments to being transparent and accountable about their processes, and we managed to somehow create a dynamic in which these cities collaborate to create new standards in which they're able to create the world's largest catalog of solutions for society. Now, what is behind that? Behind that lies something that said, we're not going to build a global institution. We're not going to go through parliaments and debating organizations, but we're actually going to use the skills of, of us as ourselves, as entrepreneurs, of convincing people and putting them on a mission as unlikely as it might be. So, uh, so what can I say? You know, that's, that's how we've tried to make uh, one part of a contribution. And, um, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's an important point in this that uh, the, the support you get in that process you know, they're welcoming environments, they're environments that, that listen to you, that, that ask you, you know, how can we benefit, how can we change the way we're doing things, and they're environments that are eternally skeptical, that say, look, we figured it all out, we're doing it well, and those environments may, may be difficult to work in. So that was a part of the challenge or the problem. What is actually CityMart doing? What's the product? What's, what, what are you delivering to these cities? So cities, we, we, we give cities a very compelling uh, uh, product. We actually get them to give us their pro problems, challenges, needs, opportunities for improvements they see. They inspire each other about what can be done, how blind people could suddenly be enabled and, and no longer become a social basket case, how tourism can become more equitable and provide more jobs and more impact to the local economy, or how childhood obesity might be battled. And, we then reach out to, to global entrepreneurs. Uh, we reach out, we find every year 10,000 new solutions for cities and society, and we match those two together and actually build a similar bond in which they can jointly invest and partner to solve some of those problems. And uh, I mean, you're now working with more than 80 cities, and when you uh, tap into a new market, what, what's so important for you as a social entrepreneur to feel welcome from that context? Or in that context? I think most of us, when, we, when you bring a new idea, a new way of doing something, a lot of us are dealing with problems that are well anchored in established and existing ways of doing things. Uh, you always receive skepticism in some form or other. Why will this work? Why should we trust you? You're a company, you're not an organization, you're not from government, you're not from here, and so on. So I think what is extremely important is that um, a community is able to articulate their problem, that they're able to to say we have issues we want to solve and that you can connect to those and find out whether you can help. And then another part is that they're open-minded about how you might do this. Social entrepreneurs are not people that do things the way that others have always done them before. It's the opposite. You try to find a completely new way of changing a system and for that you need open-mindedness, you need trust and you need what we call our heroes, those public leaders or business leaders in a community that say, We'll go for it. We'll try something different. Mm. So uh, let's say, I mean, we learned today that uh, a lot of the necessary information, we already have it. And I also really believe that a lot of the solutions are already there. They're already existing. The challenge of our center is very much to make sure we bring them, bring them together and make sure they can scale into context where the problem or the challenge are. So I really hope we can, uh, we can dare talk more and more about the solutions and gather around them and that that can be a tipping point or a starting point for something that is changing the conversation. Thank you. Thanks.